Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. Thanksgiving is taking place in the United States, and as you look out over your table and see all the food, perhaps you'll want to think a little bit about where that food comes from. Certainly some of it comes from California, and much of it will come from undocumented workers laboring in the United States. Frank Bardicke has recently written a book about California farm workers. The title of the book is Trampling Out the Vintage, Cesar Chavez and the Two Souls of the United Farm Workers. And he joins us now from the Perry studio in Amherst, Massachusetts, to talk about the current situation and some of the history of undocumented farm workers in particular in the United States. Thanks for joining us, Frank. Uh, glad to be here. So uh, just really quickly, a little story. Uh, in, in 1991, I was researching a film, and I was standing on the Tijuana American border, and on either side of me were hundreds of, of people, mostly men, but some women, about to cross the border into the United States, waiting for the sun to go down. And on the other side of the border, waiting to stop them from entering the United States, was nobody, because it was harvest season. And it was, it was rather clear that this whole thing was a kind of dance that had, to some extent, been orchestrated. Um, and, and then, of course, once the workers got to California, it was a whole different story. Then they were threatened with immigration laws and deportation uh, in order to uh, lower wages and such. So uh, talk a little bit about that period, Frank, and then how, have things changed? Yeah, what you experienced in 1991 actually was um, historically based with the Bracero program. And the Bracero program between um, 1941 and 1964 was a contract, the contracted Mexican workers were brought um, to work in the California fields and they were here just for the harvest and then they were returned to um, Mexico and they could only work for the people who contracted them. They were only semi-free workers. And when the Bracero program ended in 1964, there was a great deal of concern about who was gonna do the work in the California fields. And in 1965, there was a, there was a tremendous shortage of labor and actually wages uh, jumped up in 1965, and the United Farm Workers Union was formed in 65 um, because of the shortage of labor. So what they did starting in 66 was they threw the border open, and people came back as undocumented workers and green carders. They made it very easy to get green cards. So from 65 up until like 90, 1985, the border was basically open. Um, the INS was underfunded, so that it, was in a, it was impossible for people to control the border. The New York Times said at the time that the INS, the, the Immigration Service, was, a, was an agency programmed to fail, and that was a, quite purposefully done so that the Mexicans who had been braceros and were skilled farm workers um, could come back as undocumented workers and green carters um, to do the work that they'd done before. Now today, today it's quite a bit different because the border has been militarized and there's a very serious attempt to stop um, free flow of people across the border. Before we get into that, I, I thought it's just it's so important that have so many millions of of farm workers and, and they're, perhaps they're now working in other forms of industry too, came to the United States practically induced to come, invited to come, and many of their children who still remain undocumented were from families that were essentially, you know, asked to come, but now they're treated as, oh, you didn't wait in line and you were, uh, uh, you know, you broke American laws and such. It doesn't get talked about very much in the immigration debate. No, it doesn't, and you're absolutely right. People, it, you know, it's, it wasn't that people were virtually asked to come or, or almost asked to come. People were literally asked to come. The, the lemon growers around Oxnard and Ventura who had used braceros, when the bracero program ended, uh, in 1965 they lost uh, almost much, most of the harvest because the braceros had not yet come back. And the uh, domestic workers just simply couldn't do the work. It's highly skilled to uh, pick a lemon tree. is actually a highly skilled activity. So the growers actually went down to Michoacan to the area where the braceros lived and they had the right to give the, the ex braceros a piece of paper, a letter, which said that if they, got, if they came back to Ventura, they would have jobs in the lemon orchards, and the braceros would take those pieces of paper to the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City, and they could get green cards for them. So a lot of people came back as green carters. 
people who didn't get green cards came back as undocumented workers. So it was like it, people weren't virtually invited. People were actually invited to come back as undocumented workers. As I say in 91, what I witnessed was hundreds of people crossing over completely unobstructed, even though supposedly they were, they were cracking down during that, that period in the early 90s. But that's not what I saw. Yeah, like if you had been in, in, um, in San Luis, Arizona, where there's also uh, lemon production, which is right on the border with San Luis, Mexico. If you had been there in 1978, what you would have seen is uh, the farm, the buses that would take people to work in the in the um, lemon orchards, on right on the uh, at the border, and then people, undocumented people, crossing the border and getting in the buses and going to work. So it was it was very naked. It was very naked. As I say, it was an agency programmed to fail. Now there were, and there were a few agents in that, eight, there were a few border patrol agents in that period who were in Salinas and were in Ventura and were in Bakersfield and Fresno, just very few to keep the threat alive, to keep the threat alive that you could be deported at any time. Well, that's what I saw when I was in South, South San Diego County and, and people were working like slaves and uh, half the time at the end of harvest season they wouldn't even get paid and if they complained about it they would be threatened with deportation. Has anything changed? Well, yeah, the situation is very different today. Um, the, because of all of the scare about immigration and because of the militarization of the border, the situation is extremely different. Um, because now it's not an open border and people can still cross the border, but it's expensive to cross the border. So if you want to cross the border at a border crossing with some border agent that's been bribed to let you through, it costs about $5,000. That's a going price. If you want to cross, to be taken across by a coyote in, um, in a portion of the desert that's somewhat dangerous, it's about $1,500 to $3,000. So that's a pretty expensive price to cross. So what's happened is, about 90% now of the people who work in the California fields were born outside of the United States. Most of them were born in Mexico. Um, about half, you know, 40 to 50% of those people are undocumented. It's become so expensive to go home to Mexico because when you come back, you have to pay such a high price that a lot of people has stay in the United States once the harvest is over who used to go home. People are kind of trapped in the United States because of the militarization of the border. And in terms of the, the, the farm workers union, the conditions, the, the issue of rights, uh, has it improved at all since, since those days? It improved greatly in the 20 years after the end of the Bracero program when the United Farm Workers Union was strong and powerful improved tremendously. People made relatively good wages, I think not even relatively good wages, excellent wages. When I worked in the fields in the celery, making $14 an hour in the 1970s. Uh, people who worked in the lettuce um, were making $20 an hour in the late 1970s. So the, during the period of UFW strength, um, conditions in the field improved dramatically, wages improved dramatically. When the UFW was defeated in the fields in the mid-1980s, wages and conditions have been deteriorating ever since. An example I'll give you is um, during the period of UFW strength, the short-handled hoe was, um, was banned. Um, the short-handled hoe, which is a very difficult uh, tool to work with, back-breaking tool, and the long-handled hoe was re it replaced it. Well, over the last 10 years, um, the growers have brought back not the short-handled hoe, but a short-handled knife, a curved knife that people have to use to weed. Um, and it's not a hoe, it's a knife, but it's used instead of the long-handled hoe, and they're getting away with it. Why do the growers want that? Well, the growers believe that it's more efficient to use a, um, a short-handled instrument to weed. It might be more, more efficient over a short period of time, like in the morning, but by the time of the afternoon, actually, when you're tired and work, been working all day, agachado, bent over, the, it turns out that the long-handled hoe is just as efficient as the short-handled one. But if you're working for a short period of time, um, to have a short-handled implement to weed, it's just simply you, do a, you can do a, um, a, more, um, a, a more efficient job, at least more quickly. But literally more back-breaking for the people doing it. More back, literally more backbreaking, not figuratively, literally more backbreaking. And what about the, how do the wages compare? You quoted ten, uh, $14 an hour, $20 an hour. What are those wages now? No, those wages have fallen way back, um, way back. So that you get more, if you work in the fields in California, in most jobs, you still get more than the minimum wage. It's, you get paid more than if you uh, work in Target or something like that. 
um, but is nothing like it used to be. Um, uh, people people in, the, in my town in Watsonville, which is where most of the strawberries come from, if you eat strawberries, if you have strawberries at your Thanksgiving table, they probably come from Watsonville, either Watsonville or Santa Barbara. People make um, about um, 10 or $11 an hour, uh, but at very, very hard work. This is work that's bent over um, all day long. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's, and it's individual piecework, so you're all on your own. And um, I have a friend who worked in the strawberries and quit after three days, and he was a fairly experienced farm worker, but he just couldn't take the strawberries. And he told me, um, he told me after he quit, no es trabajo es castigo de Dios, which is a way of saying, this isn't work, it's a punishment from God. So um, uh, very, very difficult work, the strawberry. What's happening now in terms of the union? What's happening in terms of fights for, for farm worker rights in California? As I said before, the United Farm Workers was defeated in the mid-1980s, and then when Cesar Chavez died in 1993, there was an attempt by the union to get back into the fields, which was which was pretty much blunted. They really, the United Farm Workers Union really has um, uh, only about 5,000 people under contract, and it, it's what it is is it, it's kind of an advocacy group. It's important as an advocacy group. It's an advocacy group for farm workers, but in terms of organizing in the fields, not much organizing is being done in the fields in California now. Well, in the next segment of our interview, let's talk about why that's the case. What happened to the United Farm Workers Union? and the struggle for rights of farm workers in California and in the United States. So please join us for part two of our interview with Frank Bardicke on The Real News Network.